Hi, this is an awareness session discussing construction, design and management regulations 2015. The purpose of CDM 2015 is to inform duty holders of their duties and responsibilities under these construction, design and management regulations. I should add a caveat to say that this training webinar is not sufficient for you to understand the full requirements and there are additional training courses you may have to undertake. This session is to provide awareness in the three areas mentioned. So we want to describe the main requirements of a duty holders under the CDM regulations. But before we go into that in too much detail, we want to give a little bit of background to the regulations and the changes. In 2015, we introduced the new regulations. These were updating the 2007 version, where there was a change associated to what was classed as a CDM coordinator, where we introduced principal contractor and principal designer into the regulations. Another key change was the requirements under domestic clients that previously did not fall under the 2007 requirements, but do so under the 2015 requirements. So there is a number of requirements under the 2017 duties that then changed um, around the requirements in 2015 and why those changes occurred. So um, the 2007 requirements didn't fully meet the EEC directive, which was put in place around temporary and mobile construction sites. And of course, these updates, the main purpose of them was to try and drive down the number of accidents and fatalities on our construction sites and building that in from a design point of view. And we wanted to remove reference to competence inside the guidance and there was no longer an approved code of practice. One of these key features of the changes was to be in line with what's classed as busy builder and a more logical process step to the regulation. So, of course, we have to remember there is uh, links from our EU directives associated to the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974, which is a requirement within the UK and any construction uh, sites have to follow this. The EU directives looked at regulations, approved codes of practice, guidance, British and European standards, and of course there's a suite of free publications available to support this. So, Approved codes of practice are around the practical guidance on how to comply with the law. There's a, a number of different uh, advice that's available to assist in how the law can be complied with. And there are also assistance in how you may, able, may be able to show alternative methods in how you demonstrate your compliance. And in, under the special legal status, you need to show how you comply not necessarily uh, just that you do comply, but under certain requirements, you may have to be able to demonstrate that. And of course, you can be prosecuted if you're in breach of the health and safety law, including CDM 2015. There are guidance to support us, usually issued by the health and safety executive. It's not compulsory to follow the guidance, but it does give you a good supporting information pack and it's free. Normally doing enough to comply with the law under these guidance should be sufficient. And it may be, as mentioned previously, that inspectors would seek compliance um, referred to that guidance. So let's give a little bit of background here around construction. So as we know, construction in the past has been one of the biggest contributors to fatalities and worksite injuries reported in the UK. So we received uh, some information from the Health and Sa Safety Executive website, which has shown that we have started to see a trend going downwards on the number of people who have been killed on a construction site. 
So back in 2015-16, we were at 47 people. And the most recent figures for 2018-2019 were at 30. The 19-20 figures will be released around uh, June 2020. It's also important that we recognise that, um, you know, there are other issues in other sectors around agricultural waste, recycling and manufacturing, which are also other high risk areas. So there's a couple of points of note that there are some positives that come out of uh, these figures. So the figures of 30, uh, which were recorded for 16, 17 and 18, 19, um, we're at the lowest recorded in construction sites ever at 30. And 144 fatalities in total for 17 and 18 uh, recorded in the Health and Safety Executive were up from the 16, 17. And what we're seeing here is that there is a, a, an average which is staying fairly consistent and not dropping as much as we would expect. Uh, we're also still seeing that older and self-employed workers are still at greater risk and therefore the fatalities associated to this continue to see a positive trend or an increase, which is something that really needs to be addressed. And of course, agricultural is still a significantly high number associated to the number of incidents recorded. So some of those statistics in a little bit more detail. So we can see here that falls from height still have a significant impact on the statistics. Likewise, we understand the portion or percentage of fatalities in various different construction activities. We see here that there are still a, a fairly large and predominant one associated to maintenance and repairs in domestic properties. And likewise, maintenance repairs in non-domestic properties. And that would maybe signify the fact that often these maintenance repairs are undertaken by uh, sole traders and uh, self-employed individuals rather than commercial companies. Looking at the major causes in construction sites, we see that falls from height and slips and trips and falls are the, the two top areas. Um, of course, slips and trips and falls can contribute to falls from height if those slips and trips and falls have happened at a place of height. Um, but the, the second figure in terms of slips and trips and falls on level um, are very close in the number two results. So let's think about other relevant statistics and why we go through this type of requirement to drive an improvement on our health and safety performance at construction sites. So 1.2 million, approximately 1.2 million people uh, or workers suffer from work-related illness each year. We have had a significant number and still continues to be very high um, related to exposure to asbestos. And we have around 70 plus thousand injuries reported under RIDR which is a, re a recordable reporting mechanism. And of course, a significant number, close to 30 million working days lost related to ill health and injury, which as you would imagine, this has a significant impact on the economy uh, with some figures from 16, 17, quoting that approximately 15 billion pounds of economic impact came from people recording ill health um, or injuries associated to work conditions. If we again look into enforcements associated to this, not necessarily related to injuries, but we have in the range of 3,000 plus enforcement notices on construction sites to duty holders every year. Um, and a number of pro, these are split up by a number of prohibition notices, improvement notices, and potential breaches as well in regulations. Some of the big numbers in here are around our working at height regulations and of course associated to CDM, which we're speaking about today. Um, this is the third, third largest breach on construction sites. 
We also have requirements under breaking down into the CDM requirements. We have requirements under principal contractor, main contractor, client duties, principal designer and the designer. And you can see here that the principal contractor and contractor are the biggest contributing factors under breaches associated to CDM 2015. So when we talk about principal contractor, this has came down to the planning and the management, the monitoring and the coordination of the work undertaken at the work site. And in terms of the contractor, it's the knowledge that's been found on site associated to the people undertaking the work, i.e. the skills they have, and also associated to the welfare facilities that have been put in place on these construction sites. We also see issues, as we always do, associated to excavation, fire safety, and stabilities around structures. Of course, we have to remember that there are sentencing guidelines that the Health and Safety Executive can enforce upon across Scot uh, England and Wales and Scotland, Northern Ireland as well. And there are sentencing guidelines which have changed and in part what these have allowed is the Health and Safety Executive under these laws to enforce larger penalties on organisations and individuals as well. So let's look at the structure and the application of the CDM regulations. So in part one, it's the commencement and interpretation and application of the requirements under the structure, where we have client duties, health and safety duties and roles, general requirements for construction sites, and then under the schedules, under Schedule 1, we have the particulars to be notified under Regulation 6, so this is the requirements of notification. Minimum welfare requirements for construction sites. Work involving particular risks, where we identify what those risks are. And transitional provision is no longer in force, where we hand over requirements to another individual. There are still requirements under these schedules, under employee, uh, responsibilities, but we have to think about the overall responsibility under principal contractor. And then there are other amendments to legislation we have to be aware of. There are a bunch of appendices that fall out from this as well. So the general, general principles of prevention, the pre-construction information, the construction phase plan, the health and safety and fire plan, and information flow during a project involving more than one contractor, which is quite a critical area and uh, often seen as a weakness on construction sites on how information passes between different contractors. And then, of course, the additional one, which is the working with domestic clients. So there's a few important definitions I would just like to get out here associated to this. So definitions for all duty holders, and these include domestic clients, remember, which can bring about a little bit of confusion to people. So principal contractor. So this is a contractor appointed to perform the duties under regulations 12 and 14. And the principal designer is the designer appointed to perform their duties under regulations 11 and 12. And of course, under regulation 12, both the principal designer and the principal contractor would have to work very closely together. And often you would find that the principal contractor may have the appointed principal designer duties as well. And under the pre-construction phase structure, so there's a period of time from the start to finish of a construction work in a project. So there has to be the construction phase. So this is the overall work from start to finish. There's a construction phase plan, which has to be drawn up under regulation 12 to 15 to show the, the, the plan that will be undertaken. And then, of course, the different activities within that, which is the various construction work that's carried out, which could be related to building works, civil, engineering works, and maybe also different construction and maintenance activities as well. There's the health and safety file, which should be prepared under Regulation 12 and also referred to under 5, and pre-construction information that may be specific to that particular site, and maybe requirements under the principal de designer's needs to understand risks associated to the site itself before it goes under construction. So let's think a little bit about the duty holders. So the client under 
2015 can also include a domestic client. Then we have the designer, who is the person that undertakes the design duties, the architects, the engineers, and so on. Then there's the principal design requirements, classes PD. And underneath this is where they consider the health and safety risks associated to CDM duties. And then there's a the principal contractor, referred to as PC, which is a person that takes ultimate responsibility across the work plan and the work activities, the contractor and the individual workers within the contractor companies. Then we have to think about the client role and their main duties. So the clients can be an organisation or an individual for whom construction work has been carried out for. And the duties that they have to include are to make sure that arrangements are in place to manage the project, that health and safety risks are managed, that other duty holders are appointed and sufficient time and resources are allocated, that relevant information is prepared and provided and importantly in advance where required, and that the PD and PC carry out their duties and that welfare facilities are provided. And you will see later on when we go into this, uh, often the client passes that responsibility back to the principal contractor to put these arrangements in place from start to finish of the job and working closely with the principal designer. So designers generally form part of a business to prefer and modify designs for a product or a building or something related to some type of construction work. So designers' duties are to eliminate and reduce or control foreseeable risks arriving during the maintenance activity, which would be happen after the construction, and also the activities associated to all construction work. Principal designer duties are a little bit more detailed, and generally designers can be appointed by the client to appoint them as principal designers under the regulations. And it's important that we understand that there is a requirement to formally appoint a principal designer. They must be able to demonstrate sufficient knowledge and experience and the ability to plan, manage, monitor and coordinate health and safety in the pre-construction phase plan. So this is where they would look at the various stages right from the design development through to work being carried out on site to ensure they understand what the key risks are and liaise where required with principal construction company or the principal contractor, sorry, and also other engineering companies. They must provide, prepare and provide all of the relevant information to the other duty holders and this always falls on the principal designer's requirements. And they must provide the relevant information on the health and safety to the principal contractor during the construction phase. So it's often that the principal designer would be required to be involved at various stages throughout the construction activity and undertake a number of visits to site to work with the principal contractor. So let's get down into the principal contractor's duties. So they would be appointed by the client to coordinate the construction phase of a project where there's more than one contractor. This is the important fact about a principal contractor. It's when there is more than one contractor required across the work site. So the duties of the principal contractor is to plan, manage and monitor and coordinate the various activities. Liaise with the client and the principal designer as required to ensure that those duties are carried out, planned and coordinated correctly. Their requirements are to prepare the construction phase plan and often that would be in working with the principal designer and organise the cooperation between the various contractors. So the principal contractor is taking that role to ensure that they liaise properly and they organise and coordinate with the other contractors working on the site. They must ensure that there are clear site instructions. They must ensure that they prevent unauthorised access, whether that be when it, the site is open and operating and also when the site is closed down at night or weekends. 
and they must consult and engage with their workers associated to all health and safety requirements, including those that go all the way back to the Health and Safety at Work Act. They must also provide suitable welfare facilities for everyone at the site. Then we get down to the contractor's duties. Do actual construction work. So these are the guys that carry out the work. They can be self-employed individuals. They can be contracting companies. So they must plan and manage the work that they will do but that's under their control. Where the projects of more than one contractor, they may have to coordinate their duties with other contractors and others within the principal contractor's requirements. And they must comply with the directions given by the principal contractor and principal designer. If it's a single contractor project and there's no requirement for a principal contractor, then the requirements under the, the need for CDM and a construction phase plan falls to that single contractor undertaking that work. And then, of course, we have the workers underneath the, this as well. So they either work for a company, which they have some level of control under a contracting company, or they could be individuals. So they should be consulted about health and safety and welfare matters. They have to take care of their own health and safety requirements specifically to them. And they must report anything that could be endangering their health and safety or the health and safety of others on the work site and outside of the work site. And they have to take responsibility to cooperate with their employer, their colleagues, other contractors, and of course, other duty holders, including principal designer, principal contractor, and possibly even the client. So we must remember about domestic clients. So has construction work done on their own home or that of a family members, not done in connection with a business? So this is individuals that request work to be undertaken in their domestic premises. So under these requirements, securing health and safety is number one. So key elements include the general principles and the prevention under Appendix 1, appointing the correct people. And remember, when we talk about the client, they can pass on these duties to the principal contractor or principal designer. Providing information, instruction and training and supervision, which is Section 2, the cooperation and communication around all the various duty holders and engaging and consulting with the workers. Obviously, these key elements around health and safety to the client are often moved on to the principal contra contractor to manage these elements throughout a job. They have to secure health and safety at the work site. So they need to ensure that under Appendix 1 of CDM regulations, they eliminate or avoid risks. They evaluate the risks that cannot be avoided. They combat the risks at source using hierarchy of controls. They adapt work to individuals that are undertaking this. Adapt to technical progress, maybe bringing in various different pieces of equipment to alleviate some risks. Release, replace dangerous activities and chemicals with non-dangerous where appropriate. And they look to provide an overall policy of prevention to try and eliminate risks. And they must give priority to the collective measures, not just looking at one individual over another. They will have to look about the activity happening at multiple stages throughout and multiple contractors and workers at the same time. And they must give the appropriate information to the employees. And again, I'll stress again that often these client duties are pushed on to the principal contractor. There are notification requirements under CDM under Regulation 6, um, and a project is a notifiable project where it has more than 30 working days, and there are more than 20 workers simultaneously at any point of time on the project, or there are more than 500 person days involved in the project, the construction project overall. So just to repeat that, 
more than 30 working days and more than 20 workers simultaneously at any point in the project or more than 500 person days of working on the site. So the client must notify the HSE in writing before the construction phase begins. Notification must contain particulars as associated to the schedule, clearly displayed in the site office, updated as necessary because of course the phase of the construction plan can change. And it's usually done using an F10 form, which can be obtained from the Health and Safety Executive website. CDM 2015 applies whether it's notifiable or not. This is only associated and only required where it's a, a notifiable project under CDM regulations. And again, I will stress often this is put back to the principal contractor or contractor to undertake this requirement. What, what is notifiable or not? So a complicated basement development likely to last 12 months, 40 days of actual work with around six people on site every day. So this is not a notifiable under the conditions. So a complete redecoration of a commercial premises anticipated to last about 35 days with six workers on site most days, but 25 on site on day one to help with the furniture removal and various activities. Well, because of those 25 guys on that site on that one day, then this does fall under a notifiable event. And then looks look at a bigger job, maybe a refurbishment of a large hotel, a few rooms each week, work to last about three months. So there are 60 actual days of work time and 10 workers on site every day. And therefore this takes us above the maximum number of days. So yes, this does become a notifiable event. So under the notification requirements, so the date of the notice and address of the construction site or precise description of the location um, and a brief description of the project is required. Typically, this also includes the name of the local authority where the site is located, contact details of the client, who the principal designer is and the principal contractor, if it's known at that point, the planned date of the start of the construction and the time allocated and duration of the construction work the estimated maximum number of people on site, the planned number and names of contractors which have been appointed, names and addresses of the designers appointed, and declaration has to be signed by or on behalf of the client. So again, it's the requirements of the client unless a principal contractor or contractor take on these duties and sign on their behalf. So let's talk about the main documentation required as part of the compliance under CDM regulations 2015. So the main documentation are appointment letters from the client to the principal designer and the principal contractor. The notification form where required and if you need to understand more about the requirements of the notification form, look at our previous video around what the requirements and obligations are. The F10 form is a responsibility of the client, but if he, he or she appoints those duties to a principal designer or principal contractor, then those duties would fall under them. The pre-construction information, which falls under Appendix 2, which a little bit more information under pre-construction requirements. Then the development of a construction phase plan, which falls under Appendix 3. And this includes construction information and CDM Wizard, which is some uh, CITB smart app that can be used to assist in this type of activity. The health and safety of file, which falls under Appendix 4. And this is important if there is more than one contractor on site. And then PAS 91, which is our pre-qualification requirements we may use when we are appointing contractors to our site and our job activities. 
It's a little bit more in PAS 91, so it's a little bit around pre-qualification requirements. So questions to assess construction supply chains. It includes health and safety questions as well as other uh, type questions. The aim is to provide a common set of questions to all who are filling it in. And it's linked to the safe scheme and procurement SSIP. And really it's to try and drive encouragement and participation from more SME companies, more smaller con construction companies and contractors um, so that they can provide the same type of information at the same time to the required principal contractor. And it demonstrates a level of professional competence. And in all cases, it references back to CDM 2015. So I have to think about there are a whole bunch of other regulations within CDM. And those are safe places of construction work. And this is associated to access and egress. The site security. So this is a documentation that would be used to manage the security of the site while it's in operation and not in operation. And of course, that security is going to be related to the risks at that site, both to the site itself and to individuals that may come onto the site. The regulations around stability and structures of the buildings, of temporary structures, and of different types of equipment used on the site. The demolition and dismantling of both existing structures, and also that may include equipment on site. Excavations. Energy distribution installations. So this is how we go about installing the energy within the facility and how that's distributed throughout the site. The prevention of drowning where it's required if this site is close to or may form part of a water structure. Traffic routes and vehicle movement both into the site and around the site. And please remember this doesn't just uh, relate to traffic, i.e. in terms of vans and cars. This also relates to the movement of traffic from plant and mobile equipment. And you may want to look at some of our other videos that link back to health and safety risks associated to mobile plant on construction sites. Emergency procedures. And of course, when those emergencies happen, what routes and exits people have to take, what protocols have to be followed, and of course, it's important to demonstrate some levels of testing and planning of these emergency procedures. What firefighting and detection practices will be put in place? And of course, this is going to link back to the risks of the site. And then we have to think about the welfare of the people at the site. The temperatures, the weather conditions, maybe site lighting formed by the environmental conditions. And of course, these also refer back to other regulations and guidance which are associated to the Health and Safety at Work Act, where we're talking about our workplace, health, safety and welfare regulations, construction information under CIS 59, which is the provision of our welfare facilities during construction work, working at height regulations, control of asbestos, and so on and so forth. There are a number of these. But please remember, CDM 2015 is not the be all and end all. This is the construction design management regulation. We have to think about the actual activities that are undertaken at the workplace. And these have to be mentioned within our construction phase plan and our health and safety file. So we have to remember that some of these may be related to lifting operations, electrical activities, confined space, how we control vibration work on the site, how we control noise on the site and hazardous chemicals and so on and so forth. These different regulations that we have to understand and control will be driven out of the construction phase plan and working with the contractors in terms of the various activities that they will undertake. A little bit of information here about some recent prosecutions that occurred under CDM 2015. So there was a DIY chain which uh, had some workers which fell from height and they failed to recognise their duties under the role of 
CDM under client and principal contractor. And then another one which was associated to an infrastructure services company uh, where they uh, find after a subcontractor was set on fire. And these were under the breaches of Regulation 25 and under their principal contractor duties and how they had to inform and manage other contractors working on site. So in this section associated to CDM 2015, we're just going to talk a little bit more about the duty holder interactions. So to understand how the duty holders interact with each other during the course of the construction project in general. So at the construction setup phase, we have to think about the information flow and how that happens. So what site arrangements and restrictions are in place associated to existing occupants? So is this particular uh, project going to be undertaken while there are existing occupants on the site? The access that you may have to give them and the security as well. We have to think about information flow and practice on the site associated to existing information we have. So maybe the drawings that may lead us to identify asbestos information, various ground conditions. There may be other surveys that need to be undertaken to provide more information. And we have to refer to the existing health and safety file and the site services. So these are some examples of some of the information that has to flow around the site and has to be available to all people working at that site. Under the pre-construction requirements, we have to look at the existing arrangements and the site arrangements and restrictions associated to how we will get to site and how we will carry out work on the site. And this information must be provided to the design and for the construction and use. OK, so the principal designer and the designers would want to know this information so they can ensure that the health and safety requirements are in place when the construction right site starts up and the use of the facility itself once it's complete. And we have to identify under the pre-construction phase any unusual or significant areas that may bring about additional concerns that could be difficult to manage the risks associated to them. So these pre-construction phases, this is where we have to iron out these issues, look for other ways of managing them through engineering, through replacement activities, or possibly even through redesign requirements. So are there any key assumptions that are being made in the design? Is there any specific requirement associated to the sequence of job activities? And is there any type of phased handover activity? So are you moving people into the facility while construction is still going on? And therefore, what controls we have to have in place? And what about temporary support that may be required, whether there's temporary construction going on, temporary facilities that need to be managed as part of that? And then let's get into the construction and handover. So what about the existing information and the site arrangements? Are they suitable for the work to be complete? Are there any unusual construction risks that have came about at the point of undertaking the handover? Do we need to ensure that we raise awareness around this? And of course, if there are assumptions from the principal design and the health and safety file, we need to ensure that that Key, these, those key assumptions are made aware of at the handover to the construction. And what about the specific sequencing of events that we've spoke about? If some of them bring about additional risks, which they often do, we need to ensure that that is brought up and well documented and communicated at the handover. And then we have to think about the handover itself. Is it done in one step or is it a phased handover from the principal designer to the construction phase and then from the construction phase into the handover to the client. And in terms of the temporary support that's needed, that could be at various stages throughout the site. When we look at the health and safety file, um, this is associated to any 
unusual maintenance or operational risks that come about. And it must hark back to key structural principles, any key assumptions that are made around health and safety risks. We have to refer to the as-built drawings and any existing health and safety information that needs to be updated. So this is a live document that may have to change if something changes in the design, if something changes in the flow of work activities, or if something changes in terms of the construction activities that are undertaken at site, or any new risks that come up. So the information flow we have to think about falls under this small uh, demonstration. So we understand at the start of the project, the client has to check what documents are already in their possession and that will be relevant to the project and anything associated to the existing health and safety file. Now, of course, we recognise that the client can pass those duties and formally instruct the principal contractor slash principal designer in many of these activities. And that must be formally done and often is. Then we have to look at the pre-construction information, which generally falls down to the client and principal designer. But of course, if the client has passed those duties on to the principal contractor, it would be the principal contractor and the principal designer. So they want to assess the adequacy of the existing information that's available to them associated to the health and safety and particular associated to the project at the early stages. So is there a requirement for any surveys to be undertaken, any structural uh, assessments to be done, any reviews associated to asbestos or anything else that could cause risk to the individuals. They need to agree arrangements and how they will fill the gaps of any of the existing information that needs further information populated within it. And they must ensure that they're preparing this pre-construction information pack so that it's available to pass on to the designers and the contractors at the work site. So we have to think about what activities we have to take to the process of the design, into the construction phase plan, and the health and safety file itself. So various requirements in these different phases and of course, we have to remember that in all cases, these activities may have to be updated if changes occur at the work site. So whether there are changes that go right back to the design level, then the principal designer has to be involved, has to be fully updating the documentation associated to that, and where required, may have to go back and update uh, any authority that they need to. Inside the construction phase plan, we need to remember that these are the pre-construction information, the information provided from the designers, and ensure that the plan is appropriately reviewed regularly and updated as required. Uh, it's important that any significant changes and important changes to risks which have increased um, that may involve multiple people within the work site. So, Last bit just to remember is associated to under CDM 2015, the requirements of working with domestic clients. So has construction work been done on their home or a family member, but not done in connection with any business? So that's a key thing, how we identify a domestic client. We have to recognize local authorities in this, where there could be landlords, charities, housing associations, and businesses attached to domestic premises like shops, not a, they do not class as domestic under CDM 2015. So the roles of the duty holders normally no different to a commercial uh, client in the situation of domestic. The key thing here is that more often than not, the domestic client will transfer their duties onto other duty holders, the contractor, the designer which is undertaking the responsibility of the work being done in their own property. Also, we have to think about projects with one contractor. So the client's duties pass to the contractor in addition to his own duties. And then the contractor would work with the designers and any other contractors on that particular project. 
If there's projects which have more than one contractor, and again, we're referring to projects at domestic uh, clients. If the client passes this duty onto the principal designer, and it has to be done by written agreement, then the principal designer becomes effectively the client and they work with the principal contractor to undertake and manage the requirements. If the client's duties passes to the principal contractor or a contractor in a control of the construction phase, then the principal contractor acts as the client and works, as, works with the principal designer. It's important to understand this because we need to know who takes accountability for the health and safety file. And of course, we have to remember the health and safety file and the risks when it comes to a domestic client should be proportional. It may be an extremely large job for a domestic client, or it could be a small piece of work and extension. The CDM regulations still retain, but they have to be proportional to the requirements of the work and the risks at the site. So working with domestic clients, we've shown on this slide a flow of how to decide whether work falls under CDM duties or does not fall under CDM duties, and shown the message of how the method of how this flows to a principal designer or principal contractor and how they take responsibility. So got to think about also additional competency under, competencies under CDM 2015. So an individual or a team must have the technical knowledge of the construction industry relevant to the project they're working on. They must understand the skills to manage and coordinate the pre-construction phase, including any design work. And where there are high risk activities which we spoke about previously under Schedule 3, there needs to be potentially a greater level of health and safety competence brought onto the project. And this may be where a health and safety advisor or health and safety consultant may be required to come in and provide that additional support. Where you would understand what these requirements are, they may fall under NEBOSH, construction certificates, or IOSH, managing safely in a construction site. And it's strongly suggested where there are these higher risk activities and you're using a health and safety advisor or external support that they demonstrate they have these certificates and competence in place. So the objective of this suite of videos associated to CDM was to describe the main requirements of the duty holders under CDM to list the main items of documentation that should be required and considered, and to understand how the duty holders interact with each other, and of course understand how they take their duties as the construction project carries on. We put in here a bunch of references that may be interested for people to get a bit more information, drill down a bit further associated to CDM requirements. And we just want to take this time to thank you. Uh, so please subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on LinkedIn. We also have free resources available on our website for anyone that wishes to get more information associated to CDM, health and safety, quality, and other such compliance activities. My name is Chris Doherty from FQM. Thank you very much.